Welcome to The Forgotten, episode 10, part 1. The beginning of the end. The time has finally come. We will now enter the conflict that will bring both the end of Napoleon and the rise of the European Pentarchy, as well as the dreadful restoration of the old order, the Befreiungskriege, part of the Sixth Coalition War. While the five other coalition wars had all resulted in grave defeats for the eponymous coalitions, this one would be different. Moreover, it would be the largest coalition war, and easily the largest war ever fought on the European continent before. Great Britain, Austria, Russia, France and of course Prussia, as well as Sweden, the bulk of the German states, Spain, the Italian states and the Netherlands would participate in it. While the Thirty Years' War and the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War for all Americans out there, were similarly pan-European, they could not compare in the army-sized department in any way. Furthermore, the war wreaked terrible havoc on the populations of Europe. It is not necessary to talk about what had happened in Russia and what would happen in Germany, France and Spain. Nearly all of the armies lived off the land, especially the French, and it's not too hard to think of what terrible measures they undertook to get their hands on clothes, food, livestock and everything they thought was worth taking with them. I've planned this episode to be a three-part episode. The first part will be followed by a second part on Monday and a third on Wednesday. Next Saturday, we will see Gneisenau's life after the war and his social and political demise and finally come to a conclusion on this hero of German and European history. We left Gneisenau as the second quartermaster general of the Silesian army, yes, I mixed something up last time, a position best compared to a modern NATO G3 officer in a general staff. He was both responsible for the quarters of the troops as well as military planning and operational training. So he is tasked with something he had been preparing for years. Armament and training of the new army. But there was a new problem. Nothing could have prepared the Prussian army for the masses of volunteers that had arrived in their camps. To von Münster in London, Gneisenau writes, the troops really spring up like mushrooms. Please send equipment and armament for 20,000 men to Kolberg immediately. We will make good use of it. As well, we suffer from serious lack of money. You know what you can do for us in here and for the German nation, noble friend. Funnily enough, he writes a follow-up letter apologizing for his weird handwriting and terrible spelling as he says that he had spent both day and night organizing the troops and did not get any sleep at all more often than not. Yet only one day later he writes to another friend that there has never been a more happy being on the face of the earth. I am finally on the march to take the fight to our oppressors and we have the best troops and 7,000 men of the finest cavalry with us. The first move of the Silesian army under Blücher goes into Saxony. The Kingdom of Saxony, a kingdom made by Napoleon during the Reichsdeputations Hauptschluss, was a loyal vassal to the French interest. Yet their resolve was wavering. The population was not too happy with their kingdom being infested with French agents and politicians, and it went over the, the Prussian at mass. The Saxon army, however, fought alongside Napoleon in the battles to come. The objective of the Prussian forces was to maintain the isolation of the French corps under Marshal Poniatowski, containing the dreaded Vistula legion, and together with the Russian corps, cross the Elbe and push Napoleon out of Saxony. In northern Germany, the Volkskrieg arose, with many Freikorps forming under the Black Duke, the Duke of Brunswick, as well as the Freikorps von Lützow, and they started to duke it out with the French, ultimately resulting in a glorious victory of an entire French corps at Lüneburg on the 2nd of April. The assault on Saxony went as planned. Without any real resistance, the Allied forces crossed the Elbe River and took control of Dresden, forcing the Saxon king to flee to Bavaria. The initiative was completely in the hands of the Allied troops and the court in Berlin rejoiced. In a memorandum to Hardenberg, still Prussian Chancellor, Gneisen now writes that this war is not an ordinary war, but it will force every citizen to join in the efforts of the state. It does not concern one province, but the safety of the throne itself. Every citizen has to do its duty, and the people who do not understand that, because of mental incapability, laziness or sheer malevolence, have to be corrected. The nobility, of course, has to be included in this, as their duties to the state are 
twice as big. Whoever is so honorless to join in with the foe or remain in his estate if the enemy conquers it has to be stripped of his rights and position. Every capable noble has to join the cavalry of the Landwehr. Everyone who helps the enemy will be executed on the spot. Every single man capable to bear arms has to join the Landwehr, regardless of him being armed with a scythe, an axe or a pike. All those points can be found in His Majesty's Landwehr decree, and it's time to form it into a law. None of it is impossible to execute, as it has been used to a large extent in Russia and, by God, truly for the best of the Russian nation. You can see that this change of tone surely shows a massive disdain for the French. This might have been a result of a very close friendship with someone who is, at least in the German historian's mind, inseparably connected to the German exclusive nationalism and has been a figure of serious debate over the course of the last 70 years. Ernst Moritz Arndt Arndt belonged to the extremely anti-French and, yes, anti-Semitic part of the German intelligence. He was both a philosopher and a poet, best known for his Was ist des deutschen Vaterland, literally What's the Homeland of the Germans, in which he concludes that it is not one of the many German states, but rather wherever the German tongue is heard and where every Frenchman, literally Franzmann, pejorative, is called an enemy and every German is called a friend. This man had the utmost admiration for Gneisenau. In an essay on him, he writes that this beautiful human being was filled with a fiery spirit and he was always flooded with thoughts and ideas, which hardly ever gave him a rest. The noble, proud and magnanimous character shone like the mild rays of the sun out of this every word and move. Arndt, however, was described by his critics as an outrageous human being, choleric and almost insanely anti-French. In his lesser-known but extremely interesting work A Small Catechism for the German Soldier, he pictures Napoleon as a tyrant and a barbarian, who rejoiced when seeing dead and wounded and made war just out of bloodlust. This stance has made him a target of debate in modern Germany, as his almost racist stance to French people, Welsche, as he called them, pretty much meaning any people that had been subdued by the Roman Empire and had become soft and decadent during the following Romanization, and his pretty obvious racism against the Jews, he published several texts about them, made him unbearable for many German politicians and historians. This led to the University of Greifswald, where he himself taught and which had received the honorary name of Ernst Moritz Arndt Universität in 1933, to lay down this name in the beginning of this year. If you ask me, this step was rather unfortunate, as the initiative of the students was solemnly forced on Arndt's many weaknesses and completely ignored that he had a seat in the first German parliament, the Paulskirchenversammlung, and massively furthered the democratic movement on German soil. Anyways, the operations in Saxony and northern Germany went well. On the 5th of April 1813, the combined Prussian and Russian forces had defeated Napoleon's stepson Eugène de Bernay, the son of his first wife, Empress Josephine, in the Battle of Mökern. Although this battle was rather small, it meant the end of the first real chance to quell the Prussian uprising swiftly as the fortified positions around Magdeburg had to be given up. But the beast itself arrived on the spot. Napoleon had reached Erfurt in the end of April 1813. He quickly assembled his forces, parts of the Army of the Main he had brought with him, mostly green recruits and his own guard, and threw them against the positions of the Allied army towards Leipzig. This led to the first major battle the Prussians had to fight. On the 2nd of May, the Battle of Großgörschen commenced, and it quickly showed the weaknesses of the new French army. Napoleon was vastly superior in numbers, around 145,000 men and 372 guns. The Allies, however, leading 88,000 men into the battle, had way more guns, around 550. The losses concerning artillery during the Russian campaign started to show. Even more terrible was the situation concerning horses. The army did not even have enough cavalry to scout the terrain and Napoleon, who had always relied on his exquisite recon and knowledge of the terrain, except for Jena and Auerstedt maybe, was left blind. This allowed the Allies to fool him into attacking the wrong force, merely a decoy, and they managed to assault the flank of the French army. Napoleon had to turn his forces and had to meet the enemy head on. Although Napoleon's forces had successfully captured the mass of the villages that were the heart of the fighting by nightfall, they had suffered almost double the casualties, 
22,000 to something around 12,000 allies. Scharnhorst and Blücher voted for continuing the battle in the morning, but the Russian commander von Wittgenstein managed to persuade the monarchs to leave the field. This rather costly remi had shown how the French were not the juggernaut they used to be, and the Prussian forces, now reformed and newly organized, were capable of performing admirably in a fight. Especially notable for us is that August von Gneisenau Jr., the eldest son who served in his father's staff, had taken over some formations during the battle and performed exemplary, an event which filled his father and his superiors with pride. Gneisenau wrote that this battle had been indecisive, but the morale of the army is in good condition. The soldiers do not think they have been defeated. But there was one irreplaceable casualty in this battle. At the peak of the fighting around the village of Großgörschen, General Gerhard von Scharnhorst took a gunshot to the knee. Although his wound rendered him unfit for command, he wanted to help the Prussian war effort and wanted to travel to Vienna to persuade the Austrians to join the war. Telling Gneisenau to take care of his sons if something happens, he parts from the army and his dear friend. It should be the last time they saw each other. He would die from his infected wound on the way to Vienna while resting in Prague on June 18, 1813. The situation of the army was more than acceptable. Yet still, Gneisenau wanted to leave Saxony, as he did not see anything to be gained out of occupying the territory and living of the land there. His idea of the war, as he wrote to the king, was to withdraw behind the fortified places of Glatz and Neisse in Silesia, reinforcing the army there and allowing the Russians some respite. During the many retreats the army had to undergo, there had been, according to one of Gneisenau's staffers, several occasions of ultra-German nationalists to execute every German they capture who and who had served in Napoleon's army. Gneisenau, so the staffer, had said that the blood of the men of the Thirty Years' War was still in their veins and that such cruelties would be probable if the war lasted long. Following a lengthy cat-and-mouse game with the superior French army, which lost more and more men to attrition as the recruits were too green or too feeble to keep the pace of this strategic movement, and during which the Allied forces were steadily reinforced, the Battle of Bautzen was nothing but a very costly tactical victory on the 20th and 21st of May. Although he had beaten back the Allied army, he did not manage to cut them in half, but he lost too many men to further pursue them, whereas the Allies just retreated further, being fed with reinforcements with each meter they came closer to their home turf. Finally arriving at Schweidnitz, the Allied army counted more than 122,000 men and was in quite the defensive position. Now Napoleon made the probably greatest mistake of his life, as he himself called it. He agreed to a six-week ceasefire, as both him and the Allies wanted to reorganize their forces. Having not played the Polish card yet, he wanted to sacrifice the Grand Duchy of Warsaw to make peace with the Russians and appease the Austrians, who were dabbling with the idea to join the coalition. Yet, this would not happen. On the 27th of June, the Austrians joined the coalition in the Convention of Reichenbach, as well as the Swedish under Bernadotte finally joining in as promised. This miscalculation would greatly affect the outcome of the war, as Napoleon blew his last chance to end it quickly and decisively as he was used to. Although he was able to greatly increase his strength, almost 400,000 men on German soil at the end of the ceasefire, the Allies quickly had around 700,000 men available. Especially the Prussian army increased its strength massively to around 270,000 men. The Allied army was divided into three separate armies, the Northern Army under the Swedish Crown Prince Bernadotte, the Silesian Army under Blücher and the Bohemian Army under Schwarzenberg, who was given supreme command. On the 17th of August, the ceasefire ended. The Allies immediately attacked furiously and defeated several of Napoleon's marshals. The decentralized command and the surprising attack of the three Allied armies in all of Germany quickly led to the shattering of several army corps. On the 23rd of August, my birthday by the way, Marshal Oudinot attempted to cut off the head of the Prussian state and taking Berlin was fouled at the Battle of Großbeeren. On the 26th of August, Blücher, with his new quartermaster general, Gneisenau, triumphed at the Katzbach and shattered Marshal Macdonald's corps, killing or taking prisoner around 38,000 men, half the force. To this day, 
rangehen wie Blücher an der Katzbach, going at it like Blücher at the Katzbach, is a synonym for dashing, furious attempt on something. As Gneisner and Blücher went straight for the kill, pushing mercilessly for the French center. Only the cavalry failed at this day, as it did not muster enough men to effectively destroy the French force. Yet Blücher's narrow mind played in Napoleon's hands, as he rather wanted to pursue the beaten foe instead of following the plan to encircle Napoleon's main force. On the same day, however, Napoleon defeated the Bohemian army under Schwarzenberg at Dresden by successfully masking his troop strength and the information that he was actually on the battlefield. After this last triumph on German soil, Napoleon decided that all his forces had to regroup at Leipzig, as his movement was greatly impeded by Cossacks and Freikorps, and he wanted to, his several shattered corps to combine and reassert their positions. So the stage was set for the pre-deciding battle of Leipzig, which will decide over the freedom of Germany and all of Europe, and bring the end to the first Napoleonic reign in Europe. But this will be the topic of next week. I wish you a good day or a good night. See you next time.